There we go. Okay, we will come into session and uh, I think quickly um, introduce ourselves, where we're from. Uh, we do have a long agenda. So um, as an example, my name is David Dean. I am from Westminster and I was appointed to the Climate Council by the Speaker of the House. Uh, Dahlia. I'm just going down my... Uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Dahlia. I'm currently at Burn Burn Academy, um, and I'm part of this committee, and I'm new this year. I'm the youth member. Welcome. Jay? Hey, folks. Uh, Jay Schaefer. I'm, I'm on the Science and Data Subcommittee, and I'm here from the Northeast Kingdom, been in Lindenville, St. Johnsbury area for about 20 years. Look forward to talking about the extreme weather climate impacts today. Good. Andrea? I'm Andrea Wright. I'm the Environmental Policy Manager at VTrans and serving as co-chair um, on this committee, of this subcommittee, and also on the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee. Scott? Hi, I'm Scott McCormick. I live in Essex Junction. I'm a member of the City of Essex Junction Planning Commission, and I'm also a new member this year. Alice? You're muted, Alice. Got it. Sorry. Um, hi, my name is Alice Peel. I'm on the Waitsfield Planning Commission, and I'm also working with CVRPC Regional Plan Committee to develop their new uh, regional plan. Um, I'm chairing that committee, and I've been on this rural resources, I think, for this will be my second year, and I'm from Waitsfield. Man. Sam? Oh. <laughs> I think we have two Anns. Uh, oh, Ann Lawless, sorry. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Lawless. I live in Wheelock. I chair the select board there, and I do outreach for the Heath Squad program that helps people do home energy audits. And I've been on the committee since it, since, since it started. Thank you. Otis. Hi, I'm Otis Elms Monroe. I'm on Andrew's team over here at VTrans. Uh, new this year, I'm state staff support um, on this committee. Good. Welcome. Michael Burke. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mike Burke. I work at Green Mountain Power. I lead the operations team there that uh, we work on resiliency of the grid and also respond to all the climate change storms event we're having. Uh, happy to be here. I think I've been on rural resilience uh, since its inception. So I've been on this team for a while. Thank you. I have no idea how you have time for this and <laughs> all of the power outages. But <laughs> well, I'm you, glad, I am glad you're here. If you notice, I was late because I was pretty busy and I looked at my watch and said, uh-oh, uh, and ran to a room. So <laughs> thanks for having me. Marion. Hi, everyone. Hello from a closet in my parents' house. Um, <laughs> my name is Marion Walls. I'm the Resilience Adaptation Coordinator at ANR's Climate Action Office. Um, New-ish member of the subcommittee, uh, but was staff support prior to this, um, working with the council. Now, Ann Margolis. <laughs> Thanks, Ann Margolis. I'm the Deputy Planning Director at the Department of Public Service, and I am also serving as staff support. Ben. We'll go on to Sue Plant. Good morning. This is Sue Plant. I work for Vermont Emergency Management, and I provide clerical support for the group. So will you be taking minutes of this meeting, Sue? Yes, sir, I will. And primarily oh, from the recording. Great. Thank you. Jay Schaefer. Oh, I'm here twice. I, just for oh. screen and video sharing. Okay. Carolyn. Hi, Caroline Paskey. I work at Vermont Emergency Management and I'm staff support. I work with uh, the State Housing Mediation Officer, Stephanie Smith. Welcome. Um, 
<laughs> Quit jumping around, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Tuping. Not here. Jared Omer? I'm, I'm here. Oh, Don't I'm worry. sorry. No, sorry. no, I'm here. I was just getting my camera on. Good morning, everybody. Leslie and Pini Giroux, um, a faculty member in geography and geosciences at the University of Vermont, the Vermont State Climatologist. I'm the House appointed member with climate change science expertise to the council serving my second term. And like Jim, also on the science and data subcommittee. Good to be here. Right. And you are uh, one of our presenters, important presenters today. Paula. Sorry, I was muted. Um, joining on my phone, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be a little uh, moving around a bit, um, so I might be off camera, um, but my name is Paula Melton. I am a member of the Climate Council representing municipal governments. Um, and I am also on the Just Transition Subcommittee in addition to this one. Um, did I miss anything I was supposed to say? <laughs> Town. Sorry, I was Where late. <laughs> oh, Brattleboro, from Brattleboro. Yeah, thank you. Us Southerners have to stick together. Yes, we do. <laughs> Broman. Bronwyn, sorry. No worries, it's a tough one. Um, Bronwyn Cook, I'm a community planning and policy manager in the Department of Housing and Community Development, and I live in Barrie. And Mark. Hi, Mark Levine, Commissioner of Health. New wish to the council and new to this committee. Great to be here. And Ben, you're back or here. <laughs> I didn't hear if you had called my name before. Hello, Ben Rose, Vermont Emergency Management Recovery and Mitigation Section Chief, coming to you from the FEMA Joint Field Office in Williston. And I am staff support. Good. Thanks, man. Nice to see you. Okay. Um, well, our uh, first presentation is uh, from uh, Dr. Dupin um, and Jay Schaefer on climate change in Vermont and uh, what's happening. Are we experiencing it? How much is it going to progress? And with that, I'll just turn it over to you, Dr. Doctors. Thanks. Jay is actually going to kick things off and I'm going to wrap it up. So, Jay, okay. go ahead. Fine. Thanks, Leslie Ann. And I'm going to leave from this device and share from another device here in just a second. Okay. Okay. Do you guys see my screen share? Yes. yes. And the sound is good as well? Yes. yes. Okay. If, you're going to be presenting. It's not sound. It's in the presentation. Because you're fine. Yep. Perfect. And so there's a lot here. And we, we hope we hit the note for all the stakeholders that are here and trying to answer where we are and where we're going. Um, again, by way of introduction, Jay Schaefer, and I have been a meteorologist by training. I used to teach in the Vermont State College system and now work in the private sector doing disaster management preparedness with the focus on electric utilities over the last two years. Um, and uh, happy to talk more about the questions we hear most often in the elevator and the, the 30 second answers that we try to give around, well, what's happening with the climate? So here's a little more information and we're going to start big and get get a little bit smaller. So it, it may be higher level and an old hat for some, but I, I hope that some folks, it, it brings us up to a common knowledge point. And Leslie Ann and I are happy to, of course, answer questions and be available as needed. OK, so I'm on my second slide. Did that transition well to the second slide? Timely? Yes. OK, great. May 1 ocean temperature anomaly. Yes. Okay. So. We have, we're putting a lot of excess energy into the climate system now through our high carbon um, economy and burning fossil fuels and greenhouse gases from those, namely carbon dioxide. And most of that heat energy is going back into the oceans. So you'll see a lot of warm on this map, which shows essentially the top layer of the ocean 
how warm it is relative to some baseline. And uh, the oceans are important because they cover 70% of the earth and they also strongly regulate weather. And since we're relatively close uh, to an ocean here in the Atlantic, uh, that's important for regulating our, our climate and what happens there with, with weather. And we're gonna try to really look at the differences and the interactions between how climate change is affecting weather events and teasing that out here is big takeaways. So we all know the earth is warming and, and what I like to say is the oven is preheated. We already have a certain temperature the earth will warm to with just with the carbon dioxide uh, concentrations we've already have. Uh, the residence time of, of carbon dioxide is 50 to 100 years. Um, so even if we mitigate and get carbon out of the atmosphere, it's going to take some time for, for the planet to start to go sideways or even start to cool down. Um, but we keep breaking records every year. And so this is just the, the black line is showing how we are above uh, pretty much all historics going back to 1940. And then if we really go back much further, our carbon intensive economy going back the last three to four million years, uh, we're putting more carbon at a faster rate than we've ever known, at least in three to four million years. And we also know that there's a strong correlation between temperatures and, and carbon. So in other words, there's a lot of heat heating that's gonna keep continuing. And um, we hope we could take the gas off of this a little bit, but we're only gonna go keep climbing up the, the hockey stick, so to speak. And last year, just for record, uh, over the climate was about one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Uh, just keep that number in mind. And if we get a little more close to home, and see this this last winter because winter is our, our our most rapidly changing season in the northeast and across Vermont. We did have across meteorological winter, December to February, the warmest temperature on record. We had um, a lot of warm nights and there was a lot of cloud cover too, and that was in partly related to just a lot of stagnant weather for certain time periods. The warmer oceans do provide more um, mo moisture in the atmosphere, which can keep things cloudier as well. And cloudier conditions during winter also means warmer nighttime temperatures. What does this mean for anyone who's lived here? I think we all know we've experienced this. We get more thaws, less reliable snow cover, and we're getting heavier precipitation events, uh, more rain on snow events, for example. And then um, as Mike Burke is keenly aware through the work that we do with him and the utilities, we're getting more wet snow to impact uh, the electric grid. This year was a banner year, uh, unfortunately, for, for wet snowfall events and outages across a lot of the state. Uh, where are we going? This the latest, this is from the last uh, most recent cap. Uh, and we see that we're going to keep going up most likely. The red line is showing our basically business as usual. And then the lower emissions or orange line is if we start to mitigate carbon emissions across the planet on a much more moderate to aggressive basis. Um, so the takeaway here, we're pretty high confidence that we're going to be increasing another two to three degrees annual temperature by 2050. And winter has warmed about twice the rate of the other seasons. And that that warming, we would continue um, to, to continue with this kind of shape, seasonal shape into the future. So um, put those two together. I think we all can kind of see that warmer winters are going to be a thing of our future, less reliable snow cover, more thaws, more rain events during the winter time. And we'll talk more about that means for hazards and, and impacts. So um, not so scientific words, I like to call this seasonal shenanigans and how climate is changing things here. Uh, our high confidence seasonal change is that we are having retreating cold with shorter winters and more precipitation events, as we just discussed and expanding warmth. We, we have this elongated period of, of warmth that's and heat that can happen earlier in May and June, although we're, we haven't quite manifested that in our regional climate quite yet. And what's actually shown itself more is that a later season warmth into October, um, September, and late August. Uh, heat events then are more likely, I think, well, we'll start to see the heat from mid to late summer into the fall. And then that combination actually creates more more seasonal variability. Weather is by its nature and always has been pretty variable in Vermont, but climate is forcing that variability to become even more significant um, because of the, the behavior of, if you just 
transpose the those two processes there, you're going to have more variability. So the, the big takeaway here, if we think about hazards and uh, impacts and vulnerability, how I like to think about this is that we're seeing the expansion of extreme weather impacts because of the emergence of them at different times of the year. So the frequency change is primarily driven by the, the, the seasonal shifts that we're discussing here. And I'll, I'll talk more about what that is in just a second. And then the intensity change, this is primarily being forced by, well, those warmer oceans, more evaporation of, of moisture. If we have more evaporation, the water cycle says you have to have more precipitation. And that precipitation signal is pretty strong in the Northeast with, with heavier precipitation events and heavier rainfall, of course, we're gonna have, um, when the flooding and hydrology events do occur, they tend to be stronger. It doesn't necessarily mean they're more frequent but when they do happen, they're more impactful. And then um, we put all this together and then you're gonna have more complex multi-hazard storms that blur the seasons of, of mental models of what you think. And I'll talk about a storm that happened just this past December that was more like an October and December type storm morphology as we meteorologists might think about it. So well, the little bit of legwork that we did just to get ready for this and uh, looking at FEMA disaster declarations, going back to the data set here, and no big surprise, I think we all know that flood is the, the number one hazard here and, and produces the greatest vulnerability. And if you think about vulnerability as frequency times intensity, and we certainly would say that flooding and heavy rainfall are going to keep being where the signal is the strongest and causing the greatest vulnerability into the future. Uh, you could see this obviously landslide and ice jams are also associated with flooding here um, because of of the way that policy works and whatnot other hazards don't get cost reimbursement and what i don't need to go into too much detail but wind can be underrepresented um, if we had a wind event or a hurricane that was a high wind event here we wind would certainly come up but those tend to be less frequent a, a hurricane like 1938 god forbid we had a storm like that again so um, in terms of the county distribution, Lamoille County had the greatest declarations at 33, but in general, most counties were around 20 to, to 30 with Grand Isle having, having the least. So there is some regional variability there. And in getting more local, we're not going to get much more local than a county basis for the sake of this presentation. There's lots of other work that VTrans has done and others looking at flood vulnerability um, you know, across infrastructure and the like. Um, by year... If you look at 1990 to, to present of uh, just disaster declarations, and this is total declarations on a county basis, uh, what we see is that there's two, what we might call like black swan or extreme events in there, Irene in 2011, and then last year's July 2023 20, flooding events. I think the question we all want to know is, well, when are we going to have those events again in the future? The problem with modeling those extreme events is that it's really hard to, to look at discrete events. We can only tease out some of the behavior in the background state, um, which says that the intensity of those is, is likely to sustain themselves. The frequency change, you know, my professional opinion is not necessarily increasing as significantly, but the other factors such as the rainfall, uh, precursor soils the, the, that occur ahead of, of heavy rainfall events, those flooding factors are likely increasing flooding risk um, and that's the secondary factor that's hard to put into in some of the science and the literature. Um, but these big events are the ones that drive a lot of the loss on, on a big uh, a big basis. Um, by hazard type, if you look at the seasonal variability here, the flooding, of course, is more of a warm season phenomena. We had uh, those events, of course, in July and August, uh, but other disaster declarations, you see that the wintertime, one thing I want to point out here is that uh, December and January has the greatest colors on the ice cream cone, so to speak, here with the largest number of hazards that caused um, disasters. So I think one of the strong events or strong signals that we may not be uh, appreciating as much is that the wintertime warming is going to cause more multi-hazard, more, more complex events, uh, more rain on snow events and snow melt that could cause uh, compounding issues like the, the mid-December storm that we had. Um, as well. So um, as I said earlier, the, the modeling of these black swan binary events is hard, hard to get at. Um, February, you could see was a resilient month here because usually cold, dry 
more robust winter conditions are, are pretty um, resilient here, but we, we don't have as many winters like that as, as we used to. And, and, you know, my training as a meteorologist, just to embellish a little bit about what some of these storms look like, I just want to talk about the July event. And uh, this was what we might call uh, an orographically enhanced or enhanced by the mountains. And the rainfall totals you could see are higher generally where the higher elevations were. And that's just based on the wind direction and how much moisture was in the air and other factors. But we generally saw five to eight inches of rain in the highest impacted areas. Some areas had close to nine inches of rainfall. Um, a little bit different of a storm signal than Irene. And then we have a, an amazing network that actually Leslie Ann and myself are co-directors on um, of citizen science observers, about 100 people across the state in their backyard. And these were the two, the 20 or so observations that experienced both July and tropical storm Irene. So you'll see that Middlesex had eight inches of, of rain in two days from the July event, but during Irene, they only had um, a little over four and a half inches. Um, and, and these, just to show the variability on a statewide basis, how meteorologically it can vary quite a bit, even though these are statewide events, local variability can be, can be pretty significant. The order of magnitude for both events, you can see from the top uh, rainfall totals in two days are still in that seven to eight to nine inch range. And both of these events had precursor soil moistures and wet conditions prior to them, um, which enhanced the, the flooding risk. Uh, Tropical storm or Hurricane Floyd in 1999 brought more rainfall, but less flooding because it was it occurred uh, on the edges of a drought. And then here's the, the October and December storm, which very much was a pure rainfall event in just a few days before uh, the holiday season. Essex, Lamoille, Orange, Orleans, Rutland, Wyndham, and Windsor counties all had disaster declarations uh, related to, to flooding and snowmelt. Our neighbors in Maine and to the right of the storm track got hit a little bit harder or a lot harder than we did. I think the, the winds coming off the oceans there produced uh, almost uh, 30 to 40 percent of their population was without power at one point during the storm. Um, we missed the worst wind based on the storm track, which came up the coast and looked like the worst of a what, a what a tropical storm might bring from a moisture standpoint, but also uh, the wind of, of a widespread nor'easter. So it was kind of like two of those storm hazards uh, together in, in one. So you know, expect more storms like this in, in future climates. And then the last storm I'll highlight was the winter storm, what was named uh, winter storm Finn. And we had two wind storms uh, within a few days of each other. This was the first one. And uh, the left-hand side, these pink shading is showing where we had wind gusts over 60 miles an hour. And this is from downsloping winds or winds from the southeast um, in Chittenden, Essex, Franklin, Lamoille, Orleans counties. So the disaster declarations for this were forced more by wind, wind damage in this storm. Um, I don't, we can't really make much claim about how this storm morphology will change with climate. Um, but having two storms like this back to back was exceptionally rare event. And then there was wet snowfall. So this is an example of a multi-hazard storm. So where you didn't have the wind, you tended to have in these pinker areas, higher wet snow loading, which was concentrated by elevation. And um, this is just a multi-hazard storm and how, how complex this could be from a, a management uh, perspective in the middle of winter. And then the other a fact here that we've come in some of our recent research at Disaster Tech is that the last 10 years have actually had more power outage disruptions from wet snow than any other hazard. Okay, so where are we going? Uh, this is from the National Climate Assessment, and this is at two degrees Celsius of warming. Remember, we hit one and a half degrees Celsius of, of global warming last year. So we're actually not too far away, as far away from this as we could be. Uh, most of the projections put the, hitting us between 2042 and 2053. And essentially the big takeaway here, uh, if you wanna just, from a meteorological indicator of heavy rainfall events, uh, like a 30 year Delta change from the last 30 years to the next 30 years is on the order of 10 to, to 20% by the three different ways you could measure heavy, heavy rainfall events. Um, so uh, this just suggests that the frequency change of these events will continue to go um, to become higher. 
And um, flooding and modeling of downstream hydrology is going to be more localized and harder to infer because of the secondary factors. But um, warmer and wetter is a pretty clear high confidence conclusion. And then just wrapping this, this up here, um, this was part of the, the figures that were included in the last cap. And uh, we look at the direction of change being left or right, and the sign being negative to the left of this line, and the sign being positive to the right, and the confidence. Um, this is really just looking at frequency change, not necessarily overall intensity change. So we see that heavy precipitation events strongly increase medium to high confidence. Same thing with heat, um, colds and snowfall coming down. And then um, wet snow was of the other hazards was at the time we predicted to moderate to high confidence and moderate to high impact. Things like ice storms and thunderstorms are lower frequency and, and have uh, weaker, weaker signals uh, in what's happening there. And I'm just going to pause because I, I said a lot there. And I want to see if Leslie Ann wanted to, to fill in any of the blanks or had some more content that she wanted to share. Sure. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Jay. Um, thanks for that overview. And I think what I'll do is um, this really set it up nicely for what's going on on the ground level here in Vermont. And I'm going to take it up to national level and bring it back down because there are a couple of things that are going on nationally that are going to be important for us as we think about updating the, the next um, iteration of the climate action plan. And some of them are the products that Jay was talking about. There are actually going to be improvements in a lot of those products and um, new technologies, new methods, new data, new science coming out of those. And one of the things that's really important is for us to continue to be in alignment with the materials, with the thinking, with the processes coming out of the National Climate Assessment as we continue to use a lot of those tools. So the, the graph that Jay still has on the screen here was, was based off of a lot of the work coming out of what's called the Climate Resilience Toolkit. And that's actually morphing into a bigger project that brings in um, the ability to map resilience and adaptation, the ability to sort of drill down to the local level and actually kind of look under the hood in, in the data that, you know, weren't able to be um, mapped easily. But we, we're getting a lot more um, facility with being able to do that now. So that's one piece I wanted to just sort of highlight. Um, there are a couple other tools that are coming online in the next few months or so that will allow us to look at a lot of those storms that Jay was talking about um, at a final level. So when we're looking at some of those storms that produce heavy multi-day precipitation, there are a lot of changes that take place on an hourly basis. And so there's um, a new product that's coming out that will allow us to actually sort of tease apart um, the, the mechanics of some of those storms so that it gives us a better sense of the, the vulnerability, both from a temporal perspective, but also from a, a spatial perspective. Um, a couple of the things that are brand new that we didn't have back in 2021 when we um, wrote and adopted last um, climate action plan is um, things like economics. I think um, Ken Jones on the science and data subcommittee was really interested in looking at um, what can we say about economics. And so that's a brand new piece that has now come to the fore that we can sort of tap into and speak a little bit more um, succinctly and clearly to what we mean in terms of things like net zero, social cost of greenhouse gases, job creation, other energy issues that are sort of coming to the fore. Um, other pieces that are brand new are that equity focus. And I know we, we started to do that. We have a wonderful Just Transition subcommittee and the ability to sort of have Just Transitions and the doing no harm sort of permeate a little bit um, better as a cross cut would be something else that we're particularly interested in. And then because we don't want to reinvent the wheel, I think there's a lot of alignment that we can be thinking about and doing from the get go alignment with the state hazard mitigation plan. I know that Caroline is on the call and probably will be speaking to that a little bit later on. Alignment with the municipal vulnerability index that was created. Um, and that itself is in alignment with the national climate assessment. Um, it will allow us to do a lot of downscaling down to the town level, which is great. I'm really excited and looking forward to doing that. Um, 
And really, when we rewrite this piece um, that Jay and I sort of led last time, to really have an eye on additional sectors like health and agriculture and air quality and economics and equity across the board so that we can bring them to bear. So that the last thing I wanted to sort of um, really highlight, and Jay talked about this, is the importance of our physical geography, looking at what has changed and what continues to change, bringing in the latest science pieces in here, and then learning from local examples. So um, in the town of Underhill, um, that's where we learn that geology needs to be at the table here. And it's something I don't always think about in the climate change space, but geology and physical geography all go together when we think about the pieces, particularly from an infrastructure perspective. So I'm going to leave it at that, um, turn it back over to David and Andrea um, to open up for any questions that you might have for, for Jay or myself. Okay, um, Michael, hand was first up. Yes, I, going back to Jay's last slide where it showed the incremental changes in the different types of weather events. And one thing I wanted to, to point out or to ask Jay was he had two separate bullets, one for extreme precipitation events and one for heavy wet snow events. And I just wanted to point out that we're actually also seeing where you could actually combine those two. We had a storm in well, it ended up being statewide. Originally, it was forecast for Southern Vermont last March. And we get after action reports from the National Weather Service. Jay now does them too for us. And in that particular event in March 2023, uh, it ended up being if you melted the snow that we got, we had over four feet of snow in some areas, and it wasn't the light and fluffy kind. And uh, the National Weather Service maps showed a melted equivalent of five and a half inches on the Stamford area in Vermont, about four and a half inches in the Jamaica area, and three and a half inches in Rockingham. So if that had been a summer event, roads would have been gone. And I don't think people realize that the extreme damage is because it's the same type of event. It just happens to fall in a frozen or in that case, half frozen state, uh, but we're actually getting extreme per precipitation events in the winter too. It's just harder to see and understand what's happening uh, unless you live in a world like I do, then then you get it. But I don't, I don't know if you'd speak to that at all, Jay. A great observation. And the one thing I didn't uh, put in writing, but I think is something that I'm seeing in it supports over a larger area, maybe not as hard to put in Vermont, is that some of these extreme storms that develop off the coast, because they're warmer and wetter, there's processes that when they develop and get stronger, force them to actually slow down and become more persistent. And if a storm's sitting there and becoming more persistent and not moving as fast, then you're going to get more precipitation events. So I think there's a secondary process there that's causing causing that to occur. Um, and I, I don't think that the gas, uh, the, the foot on that gas pedal is not going to come off anytime soon. And one, one of the things that um, we, we don't always think about is wind. And I know both of you just talked about wind. And that's what the folks in Maine are dealing with, especially down Maine and coastal Maine, where it's it's the heavy winds that are then compounding a lot of the other um, precipitation that's actually falling that makes it even a double whammy. So that sort of speaks to the fact that we have to think about multi-hazards, compound hazards, complex hazards in ways that we probably haven't thought about before, whether it's from a, a moisture perspective or whether it's from an atmospheric perspective. Alice, and then Scott. And I just uh, yes. want to remember everybody, we, we've got a lot to cover today. So I, uh, with a group with this much intellect, we're going to get thousands of questions, but we don't have time. <laughs> so... Try and compress a bit, if you will, Alice. And yes, next. I will. I will, David. I tend to Thank be long-winded sometimes. Um, wind. Um, here in Waitsfield and the Mad River Valley, um, on our local hazard mitigation plan, the group working on this moved wind up in worrying about... We moved it up in frequency and... Um, uh, day, like day, we moved it up, ranking it as one of the things we're much more concerned about here. And so my question becomes, because of the geology and the different areas that these storms hit and people live in, are we looking at possibly unique 
hazards and or different hazards in different areas. I mean, some of it depends on the storms, but we have two things in Waitsfield. One is sometimes where winds are completely blocked because they remain on the west side of the greens. But on the other hand, we have a phenomenon where they can come up over the mountain and across and really pick up during um, thunderstorms and just on their own, this kind of, um, I forget what they're called, they're kind of like direct wind damage, um, straight line wind damage. So we experience both here. Doctors, it, it, yeah, they're, they're, observation, any import or? So those sound like um, what, what we call Shirkshires here. Those straight line winds that come down on one side of the mountain. And there, there are a number of places across the greens on either side, the greens are particularly prone to, to, to those. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think wind is such an important piece, but it's also a challenging thing to, to sort of quantify because we don't have anemometers or wind instruments everywhere. So if, if there are a number of those places that we can identify from anecdotal evidence and then try to see if we can tease out some sort of mechanism to kind of quantify that, that would get us a, a whole lot further than we are right now. Scott? Uh, just a quick one. Um, I was putting in the chat. The state hazard mitigation plan ranks heat as the third largest hazard facing the state. And I wonder, um, Jay, you didn't mention heat as a potential source of a declaration, disaster declaration. Is that something in the future that might become part of FEMA's declaration? I think it will eventually. Yeah. I And heat is more of a chronic event than an acute event. I focus more on acute event, but like heat and drought are more chronic and they lurk up on seasonal change. Um, we're not seeing the heat events, and I think some of the projections of extreme heat quite in the Northeast because of a lot of things with the proximity to the oceans and the, and the meteorological part of where we are in the continent, um, like, like we're seeing heat in, in the Western United States and drier climates. The, in other words, the moisture here is a good, is still governing a lot of, of the extreme heat events from happening. And the other thing too, physiologically, we're not um, as as prone to high heat events as, as folks who live in the southern part of the U.S., for example. But it doesn't mean that we're not um, immune. And I know Jared's on the call, um, and and Jared thinks really, really long and hard about heat because the the, the the Vermont Department of Health does a lot of warnings about heat, especially in some times of the year. So it's it's there, and I think Caroline may also speak to some of the um, the rankings that we did when we were putting together the 2023 state has a mitigation plan in where some of those things land, landed. So I just put two people on the spot, and I'm not going to say who's going to go first, but that might be part of the larger discussion. Well, yeah, that, that, part that, of the is, that is coming up later in the agenda, Ben, and then I'm I'm going to close down questioning and move on to the next agenda item. Sorry, uh, Ben. Thank you. Uh, on the question of heat, I just want to mention that, yes, it is a growing concern, as I've noted in the hazard mitigation plan. It doesn't fall into the traditional FEMA disaster category very neatly because there's typically not infrastructure damage. It's, it's more individual assistance, heating and cooling, some emergency response costs, but it doesn't necessarily show up as having the multi-million dollar infrastructure impacts that flooding and wind have. All right, well, it's been mentioned several times, the State Hazard Mitigation Plan, and Carolyn, if uh, you could join us. Um, and um, lead a discussion about the State Hazard Mitigation Plan. Absolutely. It looks like I might be having some internet issues, so I'm going to keep my camera off, but um, I'm, I'm happy to be here and presenting on the State House Mediation Plan. Let me know if there's any issues with audio, and, and I'll try to fix those. Okay. And I'm just going to share my screen if I can. Let's see. Do you need to give her permission, Marion? Or... Is it working? Oh. Oops. 
I mean, yeah, it's there, we go. there we go. Okay. And it looks, everything looks fine. There's no extra screens on there. Looks good. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Caroline Paskey, and I'm a state hazard mediation planner uh, over at Vermont Emergency Management. And um, within VM, my responsibility is to provide technical assistance to our municipalities and regional planning commissions and even private consultants on developing local hazard mitigation plans. And we also review and FEMA approve uh, each of the local hazard mitigation plans in the state. And we also develop, maintain, and implement the state hazard mitigation plan. So what is hazard mitigation? Uh, in Vermont, we have a number of natural hazards. I'm so happy that we had uh, the presentation before this to, to talk about that a little bit more. Um, obviously, we deal with flooding. Uh, we have fluvial erosion and landslides, ice jams, snow, um, and, and a number of things we'll dive into a little bit more. So hazard mitigation, by definition, is any sustained action taken to, to reduce or eliminate long-term risk to people and property due to natural or man-made disasters. So that probably sounds a lot like adaptation to this group, um, since you're thinking about climate change adaptation. So you can use adaptation and hazard mitigation pretty interchangeably. Um, and basically it's in, um, the potential loss of life and property. How can we fix our situation and, and avoid that damage going forward long-term? So we have both state and local hazard mediation plans, which I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, they are both a path for resilience, both at the local and the state level. FEMA requires that we have these plans to access funding and our state plan serves as the primary resource for our local plans. So local planning in Vermont, they expire every five years, um, a big, big effort for our small towns. Right now we have about 61% of approval rate for local hazard mitigation plans across the state. And you can see that in that light like, blue purple color. Uh, we have a number of plans that are gonna expire soon and also expired plans. So every year we try to get to that blue purple color for all of our municipalities and we're getting more, uh, more municipalities on board every year. But planning is a huge effort. So what is the, what is the motivation for local communities to, to do this? I'm sure there's some folks that might want uh, to jump in here too. Um, but so obviously community resilience. This is the opportunity to put together that wish list of projects and initiatives. So when funding comes available, you know what your community wants to do. It's also an excellent opportunity to build those relationships um, with the public stakeholders, um, your technical assistance experts, so that you can build resilience uh, comprehensively with the community. Local hazard mitigation plans uh, provide access to hazard mitigation grants, both from VEM and FEMA. Um, it helps with increasing the... Uh, you just faded out, Carolyn. Ah. Unstable signal. <laughs> We've all been there, right? We can hear you back. now. Yeah, welcome back. Or we could hear you and right, we lost your screen. No, please okay. proceed. Okay. All right. Here, let me share again. You've lost the share. Oh, there you go. You got it. All right, you can hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So um, it local plans help increase that ERAF rate, which I'll dive into a little bit more. And it also allows for the adoption of flood regulations um, in the absence of local plans. So there's a number of motivations to have a local hazard mitigation plan and reasons for uh, us to encourage all plans, all communities to have a plan in place. So the ERAF rate, uh, I won't 
spend too much time on this. It's pretty complicated. Um, there's a number of steps that a community takes to increase the match, uh, the help that the state provides to meet the FEMA required local match for public assistance grants. So that funding that you get immediately after a disaster to rebuild town halls or roads. Um, so a community can uh, have in place their national flood insurance program, which most communities do, road and bridge standards, also very common, their local emergency management plan, which also lives at VEM, but is different from the local hazard mitigation plan. They can also increase that rate by having river corridor protection bylaws or participating in the community reading system. So if there's any questions there, let me know, but I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward from this at this point. Uh, the corridor, river corridor protection is still a, a, a voluntary program, correct? Correct. It shouldn't be, in my opinion, but okay, thanks. It's political, yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's look at state planning a little bit more. So in Vermont, uh, our, our mission statement for our state house mediation plan is a safe and resilient Vermont in the face of climate change and natural disasters. And that mission has not changed since 2018 when we had our last plan. So our most recent plan was uh, uh, adopted by the state and approved by FEMA in 2023 in November. We had spent uh, quite a bit of time on this plan, started way before our July flooding. Uh, and it started with applying for funding from FEMA, hiring a consultant to help us with uh, some of our meeting facilitation, uh, going, having a series of meetings, working with partners, a lot of research, a lot of writing, and finally getting our plan approved and adopted. Adopted and approved would be the correct order. So I would love to go through all the couple hundred pages of the plan with you today, but I'm going to just tell you the structure so you can go to it if you need it. If you need any information, you'll hopefully know where to find it, but you can always contact me and I will help you through that as well. So in our section one, we have an executive summary. So quick read of what's in the plan. We, section two, you can probably skip over. It's about planning process. Section three uh, is uh, state, state and local capabilities. So that's ex uh, existing policies and grants, et cetera. I'll talk about that a little bit more. Section four, Vermont profile and hazard assessment. Section five, we try to pull it all together and talk about vulnerability a little bit more to set us up for a mitigation strategy. And then we dive into maintenance and implementation. So in capabilities, you can find funding, tools and data, technical assistance, regulations and implementation. Again, if you have any questions, let me know, but this is a really great resource if you're trying to understand the current landscape of what's out there to help you through this planning process. Section four, we're really diving into the meat of it. Uh, so, um, sorry for any vegetarians. Um, so we uh, we talk about what Vermont looks like, what's our landscape, what's our demographics, what are we working with when we're impacted by a hazard. Um, then we look at our hazard assessment or our ranking, which uh, was spoken about just briefly before this presentation, and we look at our hazard profile. So really diving into what, what are these hazards, what can they do, uh, what can we expect within Vermont. We also um, include information from our local planning assessments in this process. I love this image that the RPC provided for me. Looking, uh, it's how Panton re, you know, they assess their hazards as as a community. It's it's really beautiful in my opinion. The the stickers and that community effort. So a number of folks on this call were part of that hazard assessment process, uh, and uh, that included looking at frequency of occurrence or probability, and that was based on previous occurrences of hazards as well as climate change projections, and also on potential impacts. So both uh, injuries, uh, damage to building, built environment, but also the well-being of our, of our residents and anyone in, in Vermont. And this is what we got. So our hazards, our full list of hazard impacts is how we look at it in Vermont. 
is fluvial erosion, inundation flooding, heat, number three now, wind, snow, ice, drought, infectious disease, cold, invasive species, landslides, wildfire, earthquake, and hail. So that is the order of that we determined of, of priority hazards within Vermont. And that is based on the potential impact to built environment, people, economy, and natural environment. Any questions there? Okay. Um, I, I, we are going to have you back after people have had a chance to read this. Uh, okay, great. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so heat, uh, you know, Jared Ulmer, I believe he's still here. He as our state specialist on this, definitely ask him questions. Uh, we, we see people going to the hospitals every year from heat as it is, and it's a major concern in Vermont. People are not acclimated. We have built our homes to keep heat in and we're not ready for heat events. Uh, it's, it's, it's scary that the impacts and how we're not prepared for this. So it is, has majorly elevated within our hazard assessment. And it's something that we're focusing on uh, in implementation. I also included a picture of infrastructure damage due to heat. Uh, this is a bridge in my home city, neighboring city of Syracuse, where the bridge actually exploded during due to heat. So it's definitely something to consider in terms of not only people, but our infrastructure and obviously our environment and con consequently our economy. We also talked about this a little bit, how different hazards can occur at the same time and they can compound impacts. They can cause each other. It, they all intermingle. Nothing's in a silo here. So for example, heat can increase the risk of wildfire. And we have to think about all of those, those, those possibilities as, as we're planning for these hazards in our communities. So if you open up the plan and you're looking at a hazard profile, uh, this is basically what you're going to find. So you're going to find the explanation of what the hazard is, uh, any particular locations that you might expect it to occur within in Vermont, uh, history of past occurrences. So what, what declared disasters have we had? And also what instances did we have where it was not a declared disaster? Trends and probability, so based on those past occurrences as well as climate change, and a, a summary of current capabilities and mitigation actions addressing that hazard. So I also wanted to note that some of our hazard profiles have a call out for climate change uh, because it's it might be a completely different uh, pattern of that hazard. So it's really it it's easier for us to look at the impacts of climate change and heat because it's increasing or severe weather because it's increasing rain, et cetera. But when it comes to something like snow, we're like, well, it's maybe decreasing. We're getting warmer winters. So what's actually happening is that, you know, there are different impacts occurring within that season um, when you normally see snow from climate change. And in a way, those changes become their own hazard. So for example, we are having a lot of flood events when there's snow melt in the winter, or we are seeing impacts in our economy due to uh, the lack of snowpack on our trees during our, our maple harvesting season. And so we need to think about all of these dynamics as, as we're, we're planning for resilience in our communities. So vulnerability is a tricky word. Um, we try not to use it when we're talking about people, but it is the standard word that we talk that we use um, for assessing where we need to focus our hazard mitigation. So vulnerability of an asset is determined by exposure to a hazard as well as pre-existing conditions. So not everyone is going to be impacted by a hazard in the same way. And that's why we talk about our frontline communities within climate change adaptation planning. Um, within our state hazard mitigation plan, we look at vulnerabilities in four categories. We look at built environment, people, natural environment, and economy, as I mentioned earlier. So for people, we talk about high risk factors. Uh, there are a number of high risk factors for people. This is not a comprehensive list, but it's some of the themes that 
really came out across hazard profiles within the state hazard mitigation plan. So we're, we're looking at people who have uh, electricity dependent in-home life support equipment, those who are isolated uh, are, or rural residents, um, those with access or mobility differences. So are they able to evacuate or are they able to do certain things to their home independently to make themselves more resilient? Our BIPOC populations, older adults, people who are pregnant, uh, those who are immunocompromised or living with chronic health conditions, our unhoused individuals, those who lived in manufactured or mobile home homes that may not be as resilient to natural disasters, our outdoor workers who are very vulnerable to heat, children and people lacking the economic and social resources to adequately prepare, adapt and recover from disaster. So within the built environment, this is, this is often what's most visible, what FEMA is really focusing on in, term, in terms of determining the impacts of a hazard. You know, we can have damages to structures and our systems uh, due, to, due to hazards and electrical, water, transportation, communication. We're looking at buildings, municipal, commercial, residential, industrial. And then there's the, all of the cascading impacts of, of those hazard impacts. So looking at people's ability to heat and cool their homes and, and the vulnerabilities there. Um, again, that life support equipment, traveling and emergency assistance. At, will, a, will a fire truck be able to get to that house? Um, safe drinking water and, and the ability to maintain your home or business is, is a huge impact. So I... I feel bad putting natural environment and economy on one slide, not giving them their own slides, but they're so closely connected in Vermont, our natural environment and our economy. Um, so for impacts to our natural environment, we're really, really looking at tree health, water quantity and quality, soil health, um, and overall ecosystem balance is, is huge and it deserves so much attention. So that's a major concern within Vermont. And then in our economy, we're looking at impacts to tourism, agriculture, forestry project products, and supply chain. And I could spend so much time on this, but if there's any any quest specific questions, let me know. But I think this audience is probably pretty familiar, but I wanted to let you know that this is in the State Housing Mitigation Plan. I wanted to dive back to people and community. Uh, so we want to be careful to not only focus on loss of life and injury when we're thinking about the impacts of a hazard. Um, so, you know, each hazard profile took an evidence-based examination of quality life impacts of hazards, and we still are likely just scratching the surface there. You can't, there's no way we could capture it all, um, and, and each circumstance is going to be unique, but we do try to do that within the plan, and I think that this will continue to evolve as we learn more about the impacts of hazards on our communities. But, we, we need to be careful that we're not just looking at the numbers of, of deaths and saying, oh, it wasn't that bad. It, you know, there's, there's lifelong impacts of these hazards that are really, really difficult to measure. So getting into our mitigation strategy, we have several goals. Uh, they fall within environment, built environment, plans and policies and education and outreach. So our goal for environment and natural systems, protect, restore, and enhance Vermont's natural resources to promote healthy and resilient ecosystems. For our built environment, enhance the resilience of our built environment, our towns, infrastructure, buildings, and cultural assets. For plans and policies, we want to develop and implement plans and policies that create resilient natural systems and built environments. And within education and outreach, we want to create a common understanding of and coordinated approach to mitigation planning and action. This is what one page of our mitigation strategy looks like. So a lot of people will open up the plan and they'll jump right to this table. And I don't blame you. There's a lot before this. And the, the, the mitigation actions are, you know, this is what we can do now. Uh, so there's, there'll probably be a lot of people that are interested in looking at this. We have 112 mitigation actions within this plan, and 43 of those were prioritized uh, by our partners in developing this plan, and 10 of those are top priority actions. So talking a little bit about our priority actions, 
within the environment and natural systems. Um, our priority actions were to develop an inventory of critical headwater and floodplain storage areas that would result in a measurable abatement of flooding. And that came from DEC Rivers team. Develop a drought plan for Vermont to use as a predictor of drought and rates of recovery. And that came from UVM, Dr. Dupigny Drew. Uh, develop a wildlife mitigation plan to address a long-term future risk of wildfire due to climate change and wildfire mitigation options. And that came from our forestry and parks recreation department. Within the built environment, we want to support municipalities in developing transportation infrastructure improvements that increase resilience using PROTECT and other funding sources. VTRANS, Andrea Wright, thank you. Um, increase public service department capacity to maximize utilization of available federal dollars. So all of that federal funding that we got uh, after COVID, how can we best utilize it? Um, in uh, utility resilience implementation work. So that came from uh, Anne Margolis and her, her staff. So plans and policies, we want to assess all state funding technical assistance and permitting programs to determine areas for better alignment around hazard mitigation priorities. We want to identify sustainable long-term funding to support local match and hazard mitigation activities that are not eligible for FEMA funding. That came from our office and completed an assessment of heat risks in urban areas of Vermont and expected impacts on historically disadvantaged populations, identify strategies for mitigating impacts. And that came from our Vermont Department of Health, Jared Ulmer. And I'll get through this really quickly. Um, so education and outreach. The Climate Action Office is prioritizing uh, the development of methodology and protocol for quantifying climate mitigation, resilience and adaptation impacts. And we are also looking to develop an analysis of existing resilience hub locations and identif identification of key components that should be co-located within a resilience hub. And we have submitted an application to start this work. So fingers crossed. So I'm not gonna get into the details on this. I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, to implement this plan, we obviously need hazard mitigation funding. Uh, these are our existing programs that we work with, uh, hazard mitigation grant program. Uh, we currently have the flood mitigation assistance swift current program and our building resilient infrastructures community, building resilient infrastructure and in communities grant program from FEMA happens every year if anyone has any questions on that. So these are the types of projects you might see uh, from good planning. We can have buyouts of properties that are going to um, be destroyed by our natural systems. Um, we can do large floodplain restoration projects that get people out of harm's way. We can build new parks like we did at the Dark River Park in Northfield. And hopefully we can remove these dams that impede the, the flow of our aquatic uh, organisms and also cause a number of flood issues. Um, that's a few more pictures. Uh, so I, my next slide, I think that Marianne might get into this a little bit, but we, we wanted to talk a little bit about the overlap between the CAP and the SHIMP. Um, they are very similar. Of course, the Climate Action Plan also includes how we can mitigate or uh, reduce the impacts or reduce climate change uh, before we see those impacts. And the SHIMP, of course, focuses on that adaptation piece and how can we go ahead and, and be prepared for the impacts that we are going to see and are seeing currently. So we have our 2018 plan that definitely informed the initial Vermont Climate Action Plan. We are working in the background on filtering those actions into the team discussion. Um, and then the Climate Action Plan played a huge role in forming the update of the uh, 2023 State Hazard Mediation Plan. And now we want to see the State Hazard Mediation Plan inform our updated Climate Action Plan. So these plans are supporting each other and, and, and helping in implementation and effectiveness. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, I work with Stephanie Smith, your State Hazard Mediation Officer. 
Um, but if you want to get in touch with us, I'm your point person on planning. Stephanie's your point person on grants. Uh, and we're happy to, to help you uh, through anything and answer any questions. And I'll stop. There. Thanks, Caroline. That was fantastic. I think building off of um, some of those last points you made, can you speak a bit to how um, BEM and then with support from the steering committee got to those top 10 actions that you showed? I think this with the CAP and the subcommittee, I think we're going to be chatting. I don't know if this meeting or at a future meeting about how we prioritize actions. And it'd be great to understand how um, that happened for the state has remediation plan. Yeah, yeah Paula, had, Paula had the same question in, in the uh, chat. Okay. I'm going to pull up this slide. So um, the the 43 priority actions were were prioritized based on impact so that um, well feasibility first then impact and then potential negative impact and we we did a comparison to to develop the priority level so feasibility is how likely is it that we have the funding and political support to make this happen um impact positive is is you know how how much will this improve our resilience within Vermont? And then potential negative impacts are those negative externalities, uh, the the unintended consequences of a mitigation action that we need to consider through this process. So, you know, a, an obvious example is if you build a, a wall for one property, is it going to cause more flooding and erosion for the property down down the street? So. We have to think about those potential impacts of each action, and then we can come up with our priority score. So if they have a high feasibility and a higher medium um, impact and a low negative impact, then we can call that a priority action. There's a little bit more detail within the plan, but that's that's the shorthand of, of how we went through that process. And then those 10 top priority actions were selected by our, um, our, our partners of developing this plan. So each of those agencies and um, primarily educational uh, institutions that were working with us on this plan. Yeah, I was curious, she was sitting around the table. Thanks for those last remarks. Other oh Alice. Yeah, your hand up. Yep, I'm here. Um just because um and as recent as yesterday, I've been working on Waitsfield's River Corridor program uh and bylaws and working on the LHMP for Waitsfield. Um I had meeting with Stacy Pomeroy, who's the director of the River Corridor program, and Ned Swanberg, who is our floodplain manager, um, district manager. I learned a couple of things. One is there are regulations um, that, and there are some rules and regulations within the River Corridor um that need that would have to be adhered to and they deal with building um building downstream from a primary residence um no build where there isn't any building right now and buffer requirements for both the river corridor and um streams running through the river corridor now have 50 foot buffer requirements on either side so there are some areas of the river corridor that you have to pay attention to immediately. Um, the other thing I found out is that the, oh, and if you do have in your, in your bylaws a completed um, river corridor program, you are eligible for an additional 5% bump in the ERAF rates for the municipality. Um, right, and they do that because river corridor planning is not required. It's obvious, yes. and it should be required, but can't get people's head around that. But a carrot uh, hung out there might get the same result. Yes, and that may change what's required and where 
uh, the River Carter program is administered and handled by may change with S213 that's going through the legislature right now. Well, it's on the governor's desk, so we can yes, hope. Yes, yes. <laughs> he may veto. All right, other, other, other questions? Well, I have one other thing. Again, to because we're well beyond. Yeah. FEMA, oh, please. with the new mapping, is going to require um, flood hazard mitigation district, new regulations and new bylaws. Um, that will be a requirement. Um, and you have to have your LHMP in place also for FEMA. All right. Um, Marion. Thanks, David. Um, uh, bringing I, this together with CAP and the oh, state plan, et cetera, please. That's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Um, I think I'm on the agenda to talk about the resilience implementation strategy, but this is intended to just be a very high overview. I think I have technically five minutes, so we'll keep it very short. Um, and I think we'll want to come back and, and chat more about it in detail a little bit at, at a later meeting. Um, but we'll share my screen and do want to speak about sort of this work that the Climate Action Office is helping lead. Um, to develop a strategy to really look at what the state is doing to build resilience to climate change and how to long-term fund those priorities and initiatives. Um, this was a uh, an initiative announced, sort of a partnership between the governor and the state treasurer that was announced early this year, I believe in early January. Um, really aimed at helping to inventory uh, what the state, so what state government is doing to build relates to climate change, understand where there are gaps and overlaps in that programmatic technical assistance and funding work, and then work with the state treasurer's office to really look at um, funding needs and funding opportunities um, to, to really think about how the state funds resilience long term. Um, so this is work the governor, when it was announced, um, called out the climate action plan and noted that this work uh, for state government to really inventory this work and identify um, cost measures should be done in tandem and together with the development of the climate action plan. Um, so this de strategy development is intended to be completed on July 1st of 2025, the same day that the Climate Council will have adopted the climate action plan. Um, I think helpful for Caroline to walk through the state hazard mitigation plan and sort of the plethora of information and, and uh, knowledge that's in that plan. And we'll note that two of the sort of priority actions, one, the inventory of uh, state programs, technical assistance and funding opportunities for alignment is really a component of this development of this strategy. And then also looking at long term funding opportunities with the treasurer's office. Um, so happy to talk about this again at a later date when we have more time, um, but we, the Climate Action Office, is helping to lead this work uh, together with partners across state government. Again, a little different than the climate, than sort of the focus of this subcommittee and the Climate Action Plan is it's just focused on state government initiatives and work. It's not really, not intended to look outside of um, where the state um, is doing this work, um, but we've broken out the this development of the strategy into sort of three phases, the first of which is that inventory of state programs where they have alignment or could have alignment with climate resilience. So um, looking at our water quality work and, and seeing where there are co-benefits and possible areas of alignment to flood resilience and other initiatives like that. Um, that work will be completed sort of at the end of this year and hope it will be helpful um, with the subcommittee as well in, in coordinating and looking at where there are potential gaps or opportunities for um, improvement in particular areas. In the medium term, we'll be really looking at prioritizing those gaps. Again, acknowledging that um, we can't do everything in the near term. So what are those priorities uh, that should be filled and, and really looked at in terms of uh, funding resources? And then in the long term, long term meaning uh, next year, um, looking and working with the state treasurer's office um, similar to how sort of the clean water budget was developed, was looking at sort of needs and opportunities in the clean water space, understanding what the costs associated with implementing those measures would be, and then developing a long-term funding strategy. And so the intent is to, to partner with the treasurer's office to do that work as well. I'm going to, somebody needs to be on mute. Um, 
So I, I again, I know we're way over on time. I um, wanted to just share this work and happy to come back to speak to it in more detail and, and think about how we can really ensure that it complements the work of the Climate Council and the subcommittee in particular in, in looking at building climate resilience. Who in the uh, Climate there, yeah. uh, Office is, uh, is hands-on with this? You and Jane or... Yep. Yeah, it's myself and Jane, and we're actually in the process of hiring um, a position to really focus on natural and working lands resilience. Um, and so that in position as well will we'll help in this effort once that person's on board. Thanks. Other questions, comments? Okay. Um... David, we should probably um, circle back to an item that we skipped over right off the bat, um, and that is to approve the um, the minutes from our last meeting. Uh, yeah, I, uh, mentally, I put it right at the end of the agenda, but we can, in fact, do it now. Uh, did everybody get a chance to... in case to... we lose people, probably better to just do it sooner than later. Everybody get a chance to take a look at it? Someone wish to make a motion to approve? Yeah, I can move to approve them. Second. I'll second that. Okay. Any comments or corrections, edits? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Or aye. Raise your hand or aye. <laughs> so that the uh, record keeper uh, can, in fact, record that it was a positive vote. Um, all right, well, we're at uh public comment. Uh, unless Marion, did you have two presentations the resilience and then the progress report? Yeah, I think uh, Andrea and I are gonna show the progress report, and I think Andrea is gonna facilitate a conversation based on that. But, um, so happy to move right into that if that makes sense. Okay, well, uh, let me see. Um, we're scheduled at 1230 to have public comment. And I know it might be difficult for those of the public uh, to miss their particular timed opportunity. So what I would like to do is offer that now to members of the public. If you would like to comment, uh, please raise your hand so that I know, I believe everybody's associated with the committee, but I don't know that for sure. Yeah, and then not, not seeing any hands go up, uh, why don't we then go on to uh, uh, the uh, next part of uh, your presentation, Maria and Andrea. Yeah, um, so happy to, I'm going to share my screen with the sort of uh, large Excel document, the PDF, or sorry, Excel document of the CAP progress report that was shared with you all. Hopefully folks have been able to download it. It is linked on our website um, and will prompt you to download an Excel um, sheet. I know some folks had an issue with it, but um, if you did let us know and we can send you an individual copy. Um, I'm going to just briefly walk through this because I know sharing Excel documents uh, in a meeting like this is rather difficult, but wanted to just um, familiarize folks with it if you haven't taken a look at it. And then I know Andrea is going to help facilitate a conversation about where we go with this progress report, how that informs um, ultimate identification of areas of focus for the subcommittee, and how that transitioned in, into the work plan. And we'll just say, I think, again, the updates from um, uh, you know, uh, Jay and, and Leslie Ann, as well as the presentation from Caroline about the state hazard mitigation plan should also inform this conversation. Um, I think it will be good to, to walk through um, where, uh, where we can kind of refocus or focus on the actions in the last climate action plan and think about how to develop a work plan um, for the next cap. So um, you all should see my screen. This is the cap action tracking spreadsheet. Um, again, it is saved online. Hopefully folks have had a chance to look at it. What this is, is a collection of all of the actions in the Climate Action Plan that the Climate Office helps to facilitate with partners 
um, a real deep dive into each of these actions to look at whether progress was being made on implementation of that particular action, and then key details about the implementation of that action that subcommittees will then use to um, think about what they want to prioritize for work over the next year and a half as we develop the next climate action plan. So you can see the spreadsheet is broken out by um, subcommittee and then for cross-sector mitigation, it's broken out into specific um, focus areas. I'm obviously on the rural resilience tab, uh, which is the one you all can, can take a look at and focus on. If folks were um, participated in the Climate Council meeting um, back in January of this year, there was an in-person Climate Council meeting where a previous version of this project progress report was shared. Uh, that had actions color coded by uh, the sort of status or progress of implementation of that particular action. So this is an updated version to that spreadsheet uh, that can help inform where work is moving forward or isn't moving forward and, and should be able to help inform our group's conversation. Um, I will say this, uh, this spreadsheet, um, uh, an older version of it was used by this subcommittee to develop the response to the House Speaker's letter when she was asking for the council to recommend actions from the climate action plan to help increase resilience to flooding. Um, again, this spreadsheet has been updated since then with more detail on the progress of the actions and information, but um, should look familiar to some uh, in, the, in the setup of it. So you can see up at the top here, um, actions are broken out by the sector or the subcommittee. So again, we're on the rural resilience tab. So these are all rural resilience actions. The pathway number, PW is pathway, strategy number, um, and then uh, action over here in uh, column I. So if folks don't know, um, again, the climate action plan was broken out into pathways, strategies, and then actions, with pathways being the sort of higher uh, overarching uh, statements, objective statements, strategies, sort of the step down of, of what we're trying to achieve, and actions are those more minute steps uh, to, to help build to those pathways and ultimately, um, and the build to the strategies and ultimately the pathways. So again, you'll see actions listed here in column I, um, and then column J are the priority rankings that um, all of the subcommittees developed uh, to determine um, which actions are ultimately included in the climate action plan. Um, so uh, given guidance, uh, uh, in the development of the last climate action plan in 2021 that the steering committee and the council developed. Um, there was a ranking system uh, developed that subcommittees used to get to a high, medium, or low ranking for actions. And then medium actions and high priority actions were ultimately included in the climate action plan. So this column J includes that ranking. Um, I think the council, I understand, is going to be developing a new set of criteria to help inform how subcommittees actually prioritize actions. Um, but this will is a helpful starting place to think about for the last climate action plan, which actions were noted as high priority. I will say that most of the actions that are included in here are high priority as those were the ones that were ultimately carried over into the CAP document. And then the next couple of columns here help to give a bit more information about the implementer of the particular action. Um, so you'll note here, column K has uh, the agency lead or other partner lead who could implement that particular action, and then co-implementers and key stakeholders. This was filled in after the climate action plan was adopted. Subcommittees did not get to identifying key implementers, so this was work that um, the Climate Action Office and other state agencies helped to lead. And then in the blue columns, uh, N and O, this is really where I think a lot of our focus could be on thinking about how, um, if we're choosing to update particular actions from the 2021 Climate Action Plan, the column O of status notes, as well as column N with action status could be really helpful to inform uh, where we wanna place our focus. So there are, um, oops, can't see it here, a handful of uh, action statuses um, that are included in column N, uh, the first being uh, that the action has been completed, which is great. That means you can check that off. Uh, the next status is um, advancing um, and then uh, being implemented, no action taken, and then action has been modified, which means the language of the particular action needed to change for whatever reason. Uh, the net definitions for um, those action statuses are included in the last column here. Um, we can jump over and take a look at it in just a minute. And then the status notes again are, are um, detailed notes from sort of the, uh, to add additional context to the information about the action. 
these were um, compiled by contacting those key implementers that were identified in uh, an earlier, that you can see identified in an earlier column and was compiled in here to provide some additional context for folks um, about uh, the status of the action and whether something needs to change and how it's moving forward or if there are particular roadblocks. And then the last handful of columns here give additional context about whether actions that are, um, are advancing uh, either need further resources, whether the implementer has authority to actually implement that particular action, or if it's a priority investment for um, state government. And then the action type is grouped by resilience and adaptation, and then mitigation and carbon sequestration were the focus of other subcommittees. So um, that's sort of a high level overview of what's included in here. Um, I was just going to um, show you know, particular ways that the subcommittee could think about um, how to use these actions from the last climate action plan to think about our work plan. I think there's sort of two key questions here for the subcommittee to, to start to talk about today and continue as we develop the work plan. The first is, are there particular actions from the last climate action plan that need refinement, uh, that need to be updated? I think Caroline showed that helpful graphic that related to actions from the state hazard mitigation plan, we might wanna take a look at some of those and think about refinement of those for the climate action plan. I think the other question is, are there groups of either sectors or focus areas um, that weren't addressed at all in the last climate action plan that you won't see in this spreadsheet because there were not actions uh, focused there. And I think one key example that we've brought up and it's great to have Dr. Levine and, and um, Jared on the call here is there really was a gap in the focus of this subcommittee and other subcommittees on public health and climate change and the impacts of climate change on the public health sector, public health resources. Um, so that could be an area of focus that this subcommittee uh, might choose to actually develop new actions for. But that won't be captured in this spreadsheet again because it wasn't sort of part of the conversation that last time around. They were busy doing something with COVID, um, so didn't have much participation in this, in this uh, process the last time around. But if we're going to look at sort of actions that were included in the last climate action plan um, and think about how, how this subcommittee might want to uh, prioritize um, updating actions, we can filter. Uh, one way to do that could be looking at high priority ranked actions from the last cap. So you can filter column J by high, medium, or low. So I already have it filtered by high. And then we could, um, if there was an interest in going this route, filter by action status, and maybe we want to take a look at those where no action is being taken. So these could be actions that maybe aren't, uh, there's no funding identified, or it hasn't been a priority in state government. And maybe that's where the subcommittee wants to focus its efforts to really think about um, uh, how to refine those actions or get better engagement on those actions um, so they can be implemented, or to, to think strategically about why are they not being implemented and what needs to change uh, in that way. So just as an example to take a look at this, um, we have, let's see, um, 19 actions that were listed as high priority by the subcommittee that given this progress report, uh, no action is currently being taken on those. So just an example of one way this subcommittee could, could use this progress report to help inform its work um, and start to think about where you wanna prioritize your activities. So I'll stop there, Andrea. Do you want me to keep this screen up or should I take it down? I just muted myself. Um, let's just keep it up for a minute because I think um, one thing I'd like to just ask in general, are there any questions about this tool and, and what we're looking at? Any sort of technical questions or, or anything? Any questions on the tool? About a comment. Um, Comments it's about terrifying it. in its size and scope <laughs> in terms of what is listed there. Um, and yeah. I thank Ben Rose for the comment about uh, uh, being brought to our knees by a disease and not even thought about that. So I'm glad that you've, uh, Mary, and you've mentioned health as something that we should look to add to um, uh, this uh, version. Scott, yeah, go Scott. Ahead. Yeah, just um, I want to follow up quickly. Um, when I went through this, I was overwhelmed. And I think yeah. going back to the cap, I'm overwhelmed. There's so many things in there. And I understand initially it's a good idea to include everything except the public health, as you mentioned. One of the things that I did, instead of just looking at the VCC meeting of January for the state mitigation plan, 
I actually watched the whole video, all four hours. And I listened to the comments of some of the counselors. And one thing that came up over and over again is trying to figure out how to prioritize some of these actions. Mm -hmm. If you look at the spreadsheet, there's a number of hives. So if the state has the capacity to manage all the highs, in other words, human resources, funding, um, legislative support, governor support, technology. then that's fine. But if you have technology, but if you don't, I think something to think about, and I'm sure maybe Andrew, you're going to talk about prioritization, but I think it would be useful to think about how to sub-prioritize some of these activities so that we can say what's most important and what can be completed within the next four years of the revised cap, for example, or what could have the most impact on GHT reductions. So that was something I took away from the council meeting. A number of people talked about the capacity of hu human capacity of the state and consultants to actually implement the plan. Yeah. And, and to reiterate their voice from what I heard in that meeting. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, reflection for sure. I totally agree. I um, am involved in some of this um, and I know a lot about what's going on because I'm communicating with state partners all the time on these things. And to see this list in this way um, is overwhelming. Um, I think there's a lot of work for us to do in acknowledging what's happening and what we have made progress on and then looking further to understand why there hasn't been much progress made on other things that could be capacity with resources that could be capacity with funding who knows um it could be there's no no lead and nobody has um really taken on uh the initiative to address some of these things um so we're gonna have to dig in i'm a little overwhelmed too to uh, be truthful with everybody in that we have you know, maybe 10 meetings to get this done, maybe, maybe not even that many. Um, and it feels like a lot of work to do when we're trying to learn so many other things in these in these meetings that we want to have. And I think we're going to have to um, come up as a group on a way for us to provide input. Um, I'm thinking we're probably going to have to do some sort of survey and try to figure out, is there an opportunity to really dig into these and see um, how there's overlap amongst them within our own subcommittee, and then what overlap there is with the other subcommittees, and how, and that's what, um, if we look at the work plan later when I talk about a crosswalk, uh, that's what I'm talking about there, and sort of trying to, as a whole um, body of the Vermont Climate Council and the subcommittees that were named from it, trying to prioritize and um, narrow down what we're talking about. Because I think there's an extreme amount of overlap um, of the way the things are li laid out here. Um, I think there's a lot of things that we can be doing and a lot of things that are being done through the state government and through private entities that are addressing a lot of these things. I also think there's overlap in those. Um, and so I think, you know, Anne, was it Anne? somebody provided some comments who couldn't be here. Um, and said, you know, one of our main roles is to connect the dots on all the things that are happening and to make those happen most efficiently and effectively. So I think that's something to keep in mind as we move on here. Um, I think we can we can have conversations about how we start to whittle that down. And, you know, does anybody have any suggestions on how we um, sort of start to do that? Is it, you know, is it through filtering um, like the tool allows? Um, we can filter, we can sort, we can do a bunch of different things there. Um, to what levels do we want to filter down? There's, you know, in the action status, there's advancing, being implemented or completed. There's a lot of different categories there. And we could kind of at least try to parse out some of those and then focus our um, work on the ones that are, you know, sort of below a certain, or, you know, filter it to certain action status categories. Well, can I, can I ask uh, you and, and Marion, uh, the, the, uh, the document I took a look at before uh, uh, this one that is now on our screens, um, contained items that, in fact, 
did not deal with resilience. They, they were important relative to uh, uh, climate change, uh, but they did not deal with resilience. Is what is in front of us here already screened that it is in fact a matter of resilience? In other words, being able to cope successfully with the effects caused by climate change. As opposed to, for, as an example, uh, steps necessary to hold us at 1.5 degrees Celsius temperature increase. That, that's important. It's vital. I'm, you know, I hope that we are working on it, but it's not resilience. I think um, that is a, a matter of opinion <laughs> and something we're going to have to try to define as a group on what we what our scope and sort of bookends are for defining resilience. Because if we look at personal resilience, community resilience, state resilience, sector resilience, like those are all different things. And so I I struggled with that when we did our exercise in the fall um, because I was not thinking of resilience in the same way as a lot of people on this group are. Um, so I and, I, and I think that can be addressed to some degree, and we should have an open conversation. And again, without everybody being able to be at all these meetings, it's a hard thing to do. But we should talk about where where are staying staying in our lanes um, a little bit and figuring out how the work of one subcommittee should be one thing, and the work of um, a different subcommittee should be something else. But go ahead, Michael. Michael, I, I was just going to. We had this conversation, I think, at our first re-meeting or maybe the last meeting we had where we needed more actionable items, right? A lot of it was, uh, like David said, uh, planning how to reduce the effects in the future, but today is now and what can we do now? Because there's already people across the state suffering from these effects now. So uh, I do think that there are things out there that we can take action on now, uh, but I just went through the whole sheet again and it still is talking about, you know, plan on how to do this or to do that. And, and we know there's things that we can do today that work. So I agree. Uh, if we can somehow focus this team on actionable items, I, I think it'd be a wonderful thing. That's a great point. If I can add quickly, David, I think you're right. There's uh, one path, I think it's pathway three under the Rosalie subcommittee that in the last cap was really focused on um, uh, electricity and energy systems for rural communities and the actions needed to support those. I'll just point out in the Global Warming Solutions Act, when it identifies the roles of each subcommittee of the Climate Council, one of the roles of the Rural Resilience Subcommittee is to develop best practice recommendations specific to rural communities for reducing municipal, school district, and residential fossil fuel consumption, fortifying critical transportation, electricity, and community infrastructure, and creating a distributed, redundant, storage-supported local electrical system. And so I think um, that's where a lot of those recommendations came from within the scope of this particular subcommittee. Um, not saying that that has to be a focus this time around, but um, just some historical context on where those recommendations came from. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, Andrew. I, uh, I I understand that, but see, the important part of that sentence is the last part, which is to be able to resist the effects of climate change on the distribution system. And I, it, um, if no one else is taking on the whole notion of reducing uh, carbon footprint, well, then fine, we, we can do that. But I would hope that someone else has that in mind um, so that we can deal with, you know, loads out of the uh, river corridor, get our housing, build our bridges and, and cul replace culverts, at, you know, that so that we can resist the effects of climate change, the storms and whatever. 
Um, I, and if that's not the will of the committee, that's fine. I'll, I will I will move to complete our plan and see that it's adopted and implemented, even if it does include that whole notion of reducing uh, carbon footprint. Uh, but I, I, it, it occurred to me since the question was, whoa, you know how many items are on this list? One way that we could reduce it is to narrow our lane. Hmm. I appear to be having some internet issues. To uh, approve the minutes. I believe I did. Okay. It was me, Sue. Thank yeah, you, Marion. This isn't about the minutes, but going back to the overwhelmingness discussion, um, ha having experienced this being overwhelmed by all of the actions many times uh, and wrestled with it, um, I, I want to add to Caroline's very good answer about how we identified the priority uh, actions in the state hazard mitigation plan, that there was also a nominal group process exercise where we had 43 or however many actions that rose to the list. And then we did the traditional facilitated exercise of giving everybody X dot what rose to the top and recognizing that the human brain can only do about five things at once. So, you know, we needed to pick a direction and go. And I, I think that there's going to be some art to this as well as science where we as you as a collective committee need to have a discussion and throw a dart at what you think is going to bend the curve most significantly and then go for it. And in the state hazard mitigation plan in 2018, we said, well, the stretch goal, the, the brass ring is if we can figure out a way to get a state level hazard mitigation program to do the things that FEMA can't or won't do. And lo and behold, the unforeseen confluence of a climate action plan and the pandemic and the ARPA funding made it possible to establish the State Flood Resilient Community Fund, which is now being retooled in S310. And the prior, one of the priority actions in the 2023 plan is to figure out a sustainable funding mechanism to sustain that state hazard mitigation program that goes beyond the ARPA funding. And I, I think we're moving towards that. So my point is, we can't do everything. Let's figure out what we want to do and do something. End of rant. I think that's I think that's Thanks. definitely right. But I think we need to um, also figure out our starting point will help us narrow that down potentially. Um, so if we want to kind of start out at a with a smaller base, um, that might be helpful in figuring out what you know, three or four priority actions are going to come from rural resilience because if we're looking for 10 priority actions from the overall um, effort, we're going to have to be pretty, pretty narrow. Yeah, what I keep, uh, uh, the, the notion of a nominal process had also occurred to me. I'm not sure how to do it via Zoom, which is the uh, meeting forum that we seem to be um, uh, stuck with, but okay, uh, Ben, comment on that or? Yeah, I, we've seen it done uh, by by various uh, facilitators. You can use Mento. There are different software programs, and I'm not a power user of any of them. But I think there are people on this call who have the skill set to um, to do sort of um, in real time polling of your committee members or something like that. Yeah, I think we can also um, do some work outside and send surveys and polls around and then um, sort of decompress the results of those at our meetings and and be transparent in that way. So, Alice and Marion. Um, 
just quickly, I just want to say, I agree with what David and Ben are saying. Um, I think what we need to decide on, and I think it's being decided for us, is there are two avenues now. Uh, one is, what do we do about implementing climate change strategies? Like what's going to fix it versus flood mitigation, disaster resilience, which would um, really be, is it going, it, I mean, there's two prongs and, and I don't see that yet in the climate action plan. And I think it's something that's going to have to be incorporated because we're faced with it now based on what's been happening in Vermont over the past year. And I think there has to be a strategy um, to help mitigate that that has to move forward fairly quickly. Mary. Yeah, I, well, I just wanted to reflect. I think we're talking a lot about, you know, how we prioritize the actions from the last cap, but I think we're missing what in my mind might be the first step is taking taking a step back and actually looking at the pathways and the strategies. So those higher level kind of sectors and focus areas and thinking about what we as a subcommittee really want to prioritize for work. Again, to my point around like public health was sort of a gap in the last climate action plan. If we just move forward with a process around looking at those existing actions from the last cap, we're going to completely miss the yeah, development too. and the need to really focus on those other areas. And so I, I would suggest, I don't know exactly how to do this, but could put some thinking behind it. But like, I think we need to take a step back and think about, you know, understanding there's a lot of fantastic actions that we could just pull directly from, from the state hazard mitigation plan and other planning efforts. What do we as a subcommittee want to focus on? Is it public health? Is it another focus on um, housing and redundant electrical systems? So taking that step back and looking at the pathway or strategy level, identifying what those focus areas are, and then connecting to the actions that either have already been identified or crafted, or if we need to craft new actions. So I think we need to take a step back before we start talking immediately about, you know, prioritizing actions, because we might we might miss the mark on some things. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty, we'll let Caroline weigh in here, but that's a pretty good segue to our um, work plan, because we don't, we're not going to prioritize actions till like August. <laughs> you know, we, right, we, need, we to, need to, we have to a lot of work to do before we get there. For doing it and to uh, have a context within how we're going, the items that we, we will be taking on. Dahlia, did you have your hand up? Carolyn? You're muted, Carolyn. I hit the camera button instead. Okay, so yeah, just to build on that thought, I, I think that it, it is important to think about what the goals are of this of this subcommittee and 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 what you want to achieve, and then developing the mitigation actions to to achieve those goals, rather than taking what exists um, and and trying to to work with that at that point. You can then take the old actions and see where they fall within what you want to achieve and figure out where the gaps are. So it, it's a resorting process. Right. And I thought that was our, our next meeting is when we're going to try and identify the gaps, right? Yeah, this is the first yeah. part of that for sure. Um, right. And then, yeah, I think we're, well, we can get into the work plan. Ben has his hand up. We only have a few minutes left. Yeah, okay. uh, yeah, for this meeting, does anybody have any um, any sense of how the logistics of this might go? We have the plan as it was enacted, the, and then we know where we stand because of the status report that uh, Marion and Andrea gave us. Observations that certain things weren't listed at all, and we know that. Uh, we at least ought to consider them. How do, how do we put that into uh, a, a a process? Uh, I I have no particular. Uh, I definitely have some mind. thoughts on on different 
exercises that we can do to try to get group consensus on sort of the baseline of objectives and goals and then you know comparing those to what our pathways are and then yeah i have i have some thoughts i can't really articulate what they are right now there's a, yeah, no, there's no, a no, no. I, yeah, bunch I of tools that. that we could use for facilitating that sort of action okay. but uh, would you want someone to work with you, Andrea, to, uh, to sort of complete that? It'd be really nice to have that for our next meeting whenever that's. Yeah. Started. Yeah. Um, yep. I would definitely want to run, you know, bounce those things off somebody. Um, I know Marion also said she has ideas, too, but um, I'm happy for anyone to help out in that. But Marion, are you willing to give Andrea a hand? Yeah. Definitely. Okay. Andrea, I'm happy to help. I have time. Scott, okay, fine. There's a there's a, a subcommittee to at least give us a plan in terms of what the logistical process steps might be, which I think would be really helpful. In every meeting I have been to since I've been on the Climate Council, not just this committee, it's like standing in front of a fire hose of information. Mm -hmm. it's just overwhelming uh, yeah so i want to get to ben's question um and then a couple of things to wrap up or comment okay ahead, thank you i know the time is short and there are two things that i really want to say um the first is to alice's comment about the differentiating between climate mitigation and climate adaptation i feel like that's a conversation we had in in the last iteration and not everybody was here for it, but I, I think there is a nomenclature problem, which is that when we in emergency management talk about hazard mitigation, we're actually talking about climate adaptation in the climate plan vernacular. Mm -hmm. So so when we the state hazard mitigation plan is how do we adapt to the reality of climate change. So this not how do we reduce our not how do we reduce our carbon footprint? Yeah. How do we live with, live with coming the coming Right. So we are focused on the reality of being grown-ups in the room that climate change is happening and we're going to have to live with it. How? How can we be resilient in the face of it? The second thing that I wanted to say it would involve a quick screen share if we can manage that. Because there's so much overlap between the conversation we're having and the conversation that's happening with respect to the 600 million flood dollar flood we had last summer and how we respond to it. And I want to show you the five prime strategy priorities of the interagency recovery coordination work that's going on with respect to federal disaster 4720. Can I share screen? Can I just, I just, Ben, I hate to cut you off because I'm sure what you have to share is, is very important and maybe we can try to do that in, in a later meeting, but we really wanted, I wanted to at least share the work plan and we didn't even get to that. And I think that's really right. critical to how we're going to move forward. Um, so if, if I could just share my screen super fast. Sure. Um, and if I can just get a five minutes in a future meeting to look at Absolutely. the recovery coordination on 2020. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, I, kind of, I don't even know how to share my screen. Is that happening or no? No. It's a multi step process here. Okay. Um, Okay, so you can see the, the slide there? Yes. Okay, um, just super quick because we have a couple of minutes to go through here. Um, we just, we have the Word document that we shared for the work plan. It's, I we all see that. We had a subgroup that worked on that. We're kind of seeing that as something that is gonna be iterative as we move on and we'll add detail. Um, so that's, I wouldn't say that's, that's the plan and that's what we're sticking to, but this, PowerPoint slide really is just um, to capture it in a picture. Um, so it's a little bit easier to, to di digest and basically just saying that, you know, we are sort of benchmarking right now, understanding what is out there with the progress report and with other state plans. And then we're gonna move into um, identifying our gaps and we're gonna have to do that in a really pointed way over June and July. 
um, and then prioritizing our gaps as we get into August. Um, and I think a big part of that for me in my mind is to talk with the other subcommittees and figure out what they are tackling and what they're bringing as priorities um, and then and working hours into that. And I think a lot of the conversation between mitigation and adaptation could come out in that. Um, and then that's where we'll, we'll have uh, um, sort of got all that prioritization together. So then we can move into starting to draft recommendations and moving out um, to focus groups and getting input on how we prioritize and where in the direction we're going and then starting to draft language around that, probably going back out to those focus groups to um, run that by them again, and then really working on the final recommendations. And I, I say ground truth recommendations, but to me that means, again, looking at the focus groups and, look, and working with our subcommittees, our other subcommittees to figure out when this all comes together, when we hand this off to the Climate Council, is it gonna be, um, you know, sort of in line with each other's recommendations um, and how, how they can put that together most efficiently um, and comprehensively and in a way that can be um, understood most easily. Um, so that's, I don't have time to go into any more detail than that, but that's sort of where we are with the work plan. Um, I think we're going to just have to do some, as far as next steps, we're going to have to do some um, figuring out of how we collect more information and thoughts and input from you all before the next meeting so that we can um, keep moving on productively. And we're gonna probably might have to do that in a couple of phases um, to, to get some input. We definitely wanna know um, who else we wanna hear from and some suggestions for that are in the draft work plan. Um, but at some point we're going to have to cut that off because we could keep learning and there's so many different things happening in this space that are important to consider, but we can't, we don't have the time to hear from everyone. So we're even going to have to um, prioritize who we hear from in the next couple of meetings. And I really don't think we have more than a couple of meetings to, to hear from people. I would think um, we have a few more guest speakers, if you will, in the next couple of meetings. And then um, maybe our August guest speaker meeting is about um, having other co-chairs present um, to kind of go through some of our actions, but um, we're over time. And I, if anybody has any input on that, that's, please provide it. But When's our next meeting? Good point. Um, I'm feeling like Fridays aren't aren't great, but does that, am I just, I don't know, maybe that's wishful thinking that we could get more than what we have here because we do have a pretty good number of members here. Yeah. So if this works for people, we'll keep doing it, but. Um, I don't see any no's. All right, what, which Friday and 12 o'clock on? It would be Friday the 14th then? Flag day. Okay, Friday the 14th at 12. Well, maybe 11. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, 11. I, so a week. I'm going to be I'm going to be iffy for attendance on that one. <laughs> it's the last day of school. It's a lot of stuff going on. Um, I'm supposed to travel that weekend, so I'm, I have to just figure that out. But I'm not going to be able okay. to be at everything either. So yeah, I, I, I will be I'd available. Um, you can't make that either. Okay, maybe we'll just put out a poll for um, the best successful meeting during that week. Okay. Uh, will Marion? Will you be able to handle that poll, or Andrea? Yeah, we'll get it done. Okay. Um, so sometime the week of June 10th, Thursday or Friday, please, because that, otherwise it's in conflict with my schedule. <laughs> well, we'll go with the poll and see where is best for everybody, but we'll, yeah, we'll do analysis. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.
Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you.